Hello, everybody. Um, this is uh, Brewing History. I'm your host, Pierre Bussière, and we are joined tonight, uh, today, we don't know what time it is yet, uh, by uh, Malcolm Purrington. He is a professor of history, but not any kind of history. He's a professor of beer history at the Northeastern University in Boston. For the past 20 years, he's been traveling the world, teaching folks about history and beer. I don't I don't think I can think of a better job to do. Um, but also, I don't think you will be surprised to know that at that time, he's been brewing his own beer in his own kitchen for the past 20 years. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I've been loving it. Doing all the different styles and just, yeah, having a fun time. Having a fun time for the past 20 years, you have got to have like your one top recipe that you want to recommend to people who listen. Yeah, actually, uh, my, my hip hop rye. I made it to be a summer beer and then I fell in love with it. So every time I brew, I'll usually like make that. It's got, I use cold yeast, um, but I add in like a bit of honey, rose hips, you know, hops. And uh, it ends up being around like seven and a half to eight percent. So not quite a summer beer. Uh, but it is so refreshing, just beautiful orange color nice. and a nice, like lacy white head. Nice. Very nice. Um, what's the closest, uh, sort of beer that that resembles? Gosh, uh, I would say, yeah, it, it really kind of, it's own, it's its own thing. I would say it's kind of like a blend of maybe a Saison and a pale ale, but on nice. the higher end, it's kind of like an Imperial pale ale. Oh, Count me in. And uh, what are you drinking tonight? I'm going with a favorite brewery of mine from Vermont. It's called Zero Gravity. Uh, mm -hmm. going with their Black Cat Porter. Nice. I'm, all, I'm also uh, thinking about going Porter very soon. Um, because, well, obviously, Porter is a beer that highly matters for what we're talking about in this very podcast. The English re uh, Industrial Revolution. The uh, revolution that changed beer forever but it also changed the world forever. So how about we uh, jump right in? Can you tell us what is the Industrial Revolution? Why did it happen? Big question. <laughs> oh, one that is still in constant debate today. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, Industrial Revolution, let me kind of point to kind of the early to mid uh, 18th century in England is kind of the origin uh, where we start seeing, well, the mechanization of work. Uh, on a large scale that just goes and goes. It's really England is kind of the origin location. And also it's the first real industrializing nation for, you know, pretty much going into the early 19th century. So you see the use of coal, not just heating homes, but to heat steam for steam engines, which initially the very first one is just to use as a pump to pump out water from coal mines right. and then begins to be used for the textile industry uh, and well, really every industry, uh, including beer. And um, I believe that brewers are one of the first adopters of the steam engine, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, it was it was revolutionary uh, on God, so many different levels because you also had a huge population boom. Uh, when you have like more, uh, you know, better mechanized agriculture, they're now able to produce a whole lot more food, mm -hmm. which leads to a lot more of a population. And a lot of people moving from rural areas to the cities like London, Liverpool, and so on. And so you have a huge population in these centers where uh, you're going from kind of a homebrew, like, you know, country ale production to now you have brewers that are able to produce beer, including Porter, on a scale that had never before been seen. It's Porter is really the, the first industrial beer ever created. But what exactly is a porter? And, and the reason I ask is, I know that's an important beer at a time. I, I believe it's one of the first beers to be truly standardized, right? Uh, for the first time, we seem to be able on a really large scale to be able to do that one beer and repeat it over again. Um, so what exactly is it? And why is it that type that is uh, drunk at that time or being exported and not other types of ales? Oh, yeah. No, Porter is very specific. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it came out of, there's lots of, you know, different myths that have been now debunked. Like one uh, was about like Ralph Harwood at his brewery in 1722. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, he was like, I'm brewing like 
an entire like basically a three threads beer yeah, um, yeah. You know, you'd have different tap for each different you know like type of like small beer strong beer and so on and he put them together as the three threads that became known as the porter and that's all basically uh totally made up by but, a journalist in the early 19th century but the the the, the theory of the three thread though it, it 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 does amount to something right there that there used to be different threads can, can you just uh, uh explain what is exactly a thread and how it was used at the time Yeah, it was actually kind of more of like a taxation trick by the brewers trying uh -huh. to avoid uh, like the strong beer taxation. Uh, so what you do is like, I mean, when you're first first brewing the beer, you have like the very first mash. You have like the most fermentable sugar coming from the grain. Mm -hmm. And so what they would do is then like, you know, that would be the strong beer. Uh, we don't have thermometers or, you know, sacrometers or things of you know, the technology to kind of like really dial in how much malt and things that are being used. Uh, so you have the strong beer, but then, you know, you're going to be using the same grain for a couple other mashes in order to like really try and get as much of the fermentable sugars out of that grain as possible, ending up with a small beer that would be, you know, very low alcohol content, which would of course be taxed much less than the right. strong beer. So you have different threads, meaning like, you know, beers made from different levels of mash with the fermentable sugars. So if you're throwing, tying them all together, what they would do is they'd have several different casks and they would blend like the strong beer into like the salt, the small beer. So it was like not quite one or the other, but you're trying to like work their way around, like avoiding the full taxation of a strong beer. So it was also like how they would do it is like before Porter was called a Porter, it was called like an entire butt beer. So a butt being like a very, like basically like three barrels worth of beer, just a very, very large cask. All right. And it's entire. So like with an I as well, with like the old English, English spelling. And so that was kind of the ability of like what the porter kind of becomes is brewers now utilizing, you know, not just like different levels of types of hops, but also grain. Mm -hmm. And once they start changing some of the laws of taxation, Uh, the grain, you know, as it gets more expensive, like paler malts, much more expensive. Uh, but because, you know, once you have steam technology, you're able to dry that malt much, you know, much better uh, using like warm air instead of, say, fire. So mm -hmm. the cheapest malt would be those that would be dried through fire and would also be much browner and darker and also bitter because, I mean, it's basically smoked malt. It'd be, it, it would give you a, a bit of a different taste too, right? One that would be much less appealing i i i remember because i i've read your thesis and you do mention that it gives a sort of smoky or it, or a bit of a smoky taste but mostly it gives uh, the beer a sort of tang mm -hmm. yeah yeah that would be uh partly because of also different types of yeast that are around i mean mm -hmm. we're we're like over half a century away from uh louis pasteur's late tooth your beer so, so right so these these yeasts they're pretty much wild aren't they or at least they're the yeast from the last the last batch mixed with just about anything else that's present in the air <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> that makes me wonder what did the inside of these massive vats that they had to age the beer what what did it look like when you just emptied the beer was it colonized with bacteria because it doesn't seem to me that they were cleaning them i No, I mean, we don't even have germ theory. Like we're over 150 years from germ wow. theory. Like we don't even really understand what's going on. So yeah, I mean, like it's, but how, how they how they counteracted that was mm -hmm. through an aging process. That was, this is something that was also key to the porter was that people liked uh, what was called stale beer. So not stale as in like old and like off. It was basically, they would age the beer out for like months and months at a time mm -hmm. in order to let the smoky flavor dissipate And then also like within these large wooden casks, um, you would have Britannomyces coming, coming out of the wood and eating as well. Mm -hmm. So as you aged it out, then that you know, kind of secondary fermentation would dissipate as well. So by the end, you would end up with a pretty like nice, more balanced, strong, dark beer. Mm -hmm. Like the grain is going to be dark, so the beer is going to be dark. And with that long period, like after a while, they stop using casks and they start using, well, vats. So mm -hmm. they start building underneath the breweries like, vast storage spaces uh, for vats to like leave these beers into so they could create that nice stale flavor that the consumers are really looking for. So stale is good. 
At that time, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. At, at that time in history, if you're in England and you're drinking porter, stale is not your enemy. Stale is good for you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. They wanted that very specific flavor that had been well, well aged, so all the other off flavors were kind of taken out. But that makes me wonder. At that time in in history, we're what uh, the uh, beginning of the 18th century, uh, early 19th century. Yeah, late 18th, early 19th. So I'm wondering. Are people drinking porter because it's there and it's what everyone's selling because of taxation? Or are they drinking beer because it really is considered better than all the other beers on the offering, on the offer? Well, or also with porter, we have to look at the specific location too. Or we're talking about like the London. Right. So like in the country, like we still have a separation between what beer is and what ale is. Ale being mm -hmm. unhopped beer being hopped and hops that hopping, you know, coming from migrations from the low countries, like, well, Belgium, Netherlands area. And so you have, you know, hops being introduced, being used uh, in a way that you wouldn't see outside, you know, in the country ale sections. So if we're looking specifically at London, this is where we have, you know, with the development of new technology. So thermometers, you know, being able to like, you know, instead of just waiting for the steam to clear at the top of the boiling vessel, you know, you can just actually know what temperature Is, or like the blood test, like, all right, how does this feel against my finger? And so with a temperature, like thermometer, you're able to do that. And a sacrometer, you're able to like figure out, you know, how much fermentable sugar is actually in there. And so all these different steps end up leaving the porter becoming the most stable and most consistent mm -hmm. of beer produced in London, which is the largest metropolitan area, you know, closest to trade. You're not seeing this being produced in Burton-upon-Trent, for instance, where you find bass, also salt brewers who are exporting brown ales, sparkling brown ales, mm -hmm. uh, to the Baltic Sea and so forth. So in London, you have this huge, like new, like working like class, this working population coming in. And you're also seeing people promote, like beer is seen as definitely safer. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people had the availability of, you know, paler ales, of lighter brown ales, Uh, I mean, it was kind of like a London Brown was what the Porter, you know, becomes like it becomes named Porter later on. Everyone already mm -hmm. knew about the like the London style Browns. What were the softer water there? And well, you're able to get economies of scale by the end of the 18th century. And right. so that beer is able to be much cheaper and much so a lot more affordable towards all the different classes that are developing um, out of kind of a rise in capital, like capitalism and industry and industry so there are massive changes that are happening at that moment in london you have the industrial revolution which is facilitating um, the kind of thing you've never seen basically in the history of beer so uh, quite extensive quality control over beer uh, aging for months for a long time and there's one other thing i'm thinking about Uh, exportation on a truly epic scale. Can you tell us a bit more about what role that's going to play in, well, the history of brewing in general, but also for England? Does that does that really change, let's say, the trade balance? How important is exporting porter to England at that time? It's one of the variety of beers being sent to the colonies. Right. Uh, Because like, I mean, honestly, if you look at the American colonies, for instance, uh, they, during the turn, like the time of the American revolution. So like, you know, 1770s and so on, mm -hmm. uh, you see the revolutionaries calling for people to be drinking beer because uh, rum was being produced for a British audience. And so to make it more American, they were saying drink beer because it's being produced here. Oh, so beer, like the, For the rest of the colonies, like it's pretty essential because you don't have, especially the warmer colonies, say British Honduras, South Africa, Australia, India, you're not going to have colonial breweries being set up uh, for until really like the middle of the 19th century. So the porter is going to be part of that. The porter is like still huge through the mid 19th century, um, but it's one of multiple, multiple different beers being sent out. Mm -hmm. So the trade is essential, but it's You know, people are, the tastes are changing farther away from London, where you're seeing, you know, pale ales becoming, you know, 
got Hodgson's ale, which kind of becomes what people know of as kind of the proto India pale ale and, you know, other types of just brown ales and things like that. So like the porters, you know, while it's representative of kind of like the London big brewers of industry, mm -hmm. it is being shipped uh, across the globe. Um, but you're finding like the lasting kind of like the strength, people are preferring something that's a bit hoppier, a bit lighter in color, lighter in body, uh, like mouthfeel uh, for those warmer climates for the different colonists. And I bet that's going to pave the way for the ascent of Pilsner, right? It's later in the, uh, the, the, at the end of the 19th century, but, but that's not, that's not quite happening yet for, let's say, uh, early in the 19th century, Porter is still king at the very least uh, oh, yeah. in, in London, right? It, it rules the place. And it seems that the brewers who are producing that beer are making so much money <laughs> because they're, they're developing these economies of scales. And one thing that they're doing that's quite fascinating is um, they start doing these partnerships, right? With the bars. They, they, mm -hmm. they, 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 they start telling them, hey... We're going to give you some money. We're going to buy you out if you're in trouble. We're going to fund you. You have something to repair. We'll fix that for you. But just one thing, sell only our beer. So what does that do for the other brewers who are not the big guys? How does that play out? Well, it plays out that you have many fewer breweries producing a lot more beer for well, what becomes the country, like by the end of the, like by the middle of the 19th century. So what we're talking about is the Tide House system. Right. Where, so it's not even just like a partnership. A lot of times it becomes kind of a domestic battle in England for the different breweries to buy as many pubs as possible to ensure their market share. So like right. they're not seeing, they're not looking at the marketing. They're not looking at, uh, well, they're really looking at like who is consuming. They're trying to figure out like how much actual land can we own where only like people can only drink our beer. So this is an on ongoing, like, I mean, because once you get over like Island of Guinness, like and they start kind of coming in, like, you know, the latter half of the 19th century, they're not doing that. They're not looking at a tide house system. Like within England, it really kind of hampers the export trade uh, in many ways because they're so focused on that tide house system of, all right, we know how much we need to produce because we control and a lot of times just outright own all of these licensed pubs across the countryside. I mean, not just all, all around London, the metropolitan area, but I mean, Liverpool, Bernard Pontrain, like throughout you know, Manchester. So like it's the huge competition isn't with like colonies, mm -hmm. with continental Europe. It's between the major brewing firms. You know, it starts off with small family businesses as they increase more and more money, they start being really, yeah. By the turn of the 19th century, they are making wild amounts of money on the level of bankers and other like people that are becoming politicians or being seen as like these power brokers because of that wealth uh, through you know, that economy of scale with the help of the industrial revolution, all that happening. So it's, it's a, such a wonderfully unique story really of kind of like the British brewing industry and it's, well, I guess kind of rise and fall on a global scale because they are able to ship. They are able to like dominate the colonial markets because there are no local breweries that can produce and you know, that have beer for like a longer shelf life. So a uh, porter does become, I mean, it's representative of this broader expanse. I mean, beer, just beer, not porter specifically is the national drink of England. Mm -hmm. And so they're exporting that and they have kind of a hubris because of how powerful and how innovative they are at the turn of the 19th century, going through the middle of the 19th century. I uh, remember from your thesis that there is a nice quote out there from uh, a couple of officials, I believe, who are doing this report on the state of British beer in the world. And I, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of there will never be any real challenger to our position and the beer export markets. And this is how you start your thesis. You're like, they could not be more wrong if if only they paid more attention and this this is sort of what i wanted to ask you it is a a, a fantastic story in a way because there's this explosion of activity really this industrious form of brewing this 
this set of innovations that create something really new and also much more affordable. But at the same time, eventually it ends. Um, especially, well, the 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 the, the porter um, appetite, the appetite for porter that eventually disappears. I believe um, the heyday of the porter manufacturing or brewing is somewhere around 1820, and then it seems to be going downhill from there. What happens? Ah, oh, tastes change. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because the porter. I mean, it was wildly popular for a few generations. I mean, maybe two. Uh, also, we haven't even talked about where the name comes from. Um, so the name of the porter, I mean, it's an off-repeated story, but like mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, it's named after that working class of men, working class men who were porters, whether they were ship porters or street porters in London, basically working as well, just just as, as animals, just carrying everything from the ships to the, like all across the city uh, on their backs, which they were drinking mostly just for the calories alone, drinking porter, like, you know, I mean, upwards of six, eight, 10 pints a day to keep themselves going. Like, wow. keep it, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I yeah. have to ask you, and I know that you've been asked that question many, many times, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got to ask you. <laughs> How are they not drunk all day long? How are they not constantly hammered if they drink that much booze? They are working their butts off. Right. <laughs> they are sweating. They are, I mean, it is part of like, they're, it's more about calories, it's more about the meal, more about like, you know, the partial hydration. Like they are working sure. so hard. Like basically, I mean, if you look at it, just their metabolisms are just rapid firing. Mm -hmm. So they're processing this pretty quickly. The beer itself is going to be, You know, it's not going to be super strong. Um, maybe rather strong, but they were probably like, yeah, definitely rather buzz through the whole day. Mm -hmm. um, but it was definitely like, I mean, the, the, the popularity with them for this specific style, which they found, you know, better than, you know, the autumnal ales that were much stronger and made in the fall. fall. Right. Or like the lighter pale ales are starting to come in, but were generally like outside of their kind of like economic reach. So, Mm -hmm. They, yeah, they were probably rather buzzed, but they were working so hard right. that they probably, I mean, they certainly didn't have enough time to even notice. Let's just pick up something a little heavy and just keep yeah. moving around. Yeah. So just, the uh, decline, yeah. So eventually there's so much that is happening right now. I'm, 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 I'm picturing these guys right now. Rather buzzed, working their butt off. I don't know the proper English expression for that, but really having a hard time most of the time and definitely sometimes when possible, you know, enjoying the extra pint that gets you going, that makes that misery of a life somehow brighter. Because this is a place and time where there are no big contracts, no organized syndicates or unions yet that can really defend you uh the life of the worker isn't really great no no it's, it is very well life is you know was it hard short like shortish hard and brutal brute mm -hmm. um yeah i mean it is yeah it's not an easy life i mean this is kind of what that that sharing of identity of like the working class develops the identity of a working class mm -hmm. over the course of the early 19th century which leads to well revolutions fights riots and then you know organization of the working class um but we don't need to get into Marx and angles right now uh, not yet <laughs> <laughs> so for the porter so it's i mean it's key for that generation too it's like the mm -hmm. industrial generation the, the classes Uh, I mean, like the upper class is drinking mostly like stuff coming from Burton upon Trent, you know, from Bass, like that lighter sparkling, you know, as, as you get the Trent navigation of the canals worked out when you have trains moving and you can get some of these beers, like mm -hmm. the wealthy class is drinking a different level of beer. And as people who enjoy Porter so much, they kind of start fading away. Like it's like in favor of, you start seeing people drinking mild and like pale ales become super right. hot. You also see what people are drinking out of change from opaque um, type of, you know, whether it's leather or pewter or, you know, stone or bone. Um, now people are able to, through the industrial revolution, can afford glassware. And they're finding just like, just how the beer looks is different. Right. Like, okay. Like, you know, this is something is it's lighter, it's sparkly, it's, you know, 
Also, generally, like the pale ales were rather strong. So using all pale malts, getting a whole lot more sugar from those grains. Mm -hmm. And you can see it. And people were worried about adulteration of beer. A lot of different laws and a lot of different, like, well, scandals over adulterating beer. Um, most of it just made up by the temperance organizations. But Are you saying this is all lies? It was not all of them, but... Uh, a lot of it was, <laughs> right? Yeah. So the pale, the pale ales really kind of come through when you see glassware becoming just more accessible. Uh, just the aesthetic appeal of a lighter colored beer becomes a thing, and you see the mild ales coming through, the pale ales, the India pale ales. Like, I mean, that term doesn't really come about to the 1830s. So you're seeing like this kind of a change, not only of what people are drinking, but also like why they're drinking it. The different classes are changing. Those mm. huge order brewers are now putting their money more towards, I mean, they're not even using all dark malts anymore. They're going to use, you know, the higher quality pale malts with a right. small amount of dark malt to make it the same color. And the people want to have a fresh beer instead of one that has been aged over time. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, lot going on, with like the consumer's preferences at the time. I'm thinking also, uh, the evolution of uh, not necessarily rights or lifestyles, but uh, maybe the better way to explain this is the betterment of overall conditions. As wealth uh, accumulates overall, some more people are lifted out of poverty and are able to afford, well, more of the good stuff, including the pale ales. Um, and then there's this other change that happens at the same time Uh, the ascent of the Pilsner. There's this, um, this, this, this one anecdote that I remember reading not too long ago about what it felt like to look at the pills when it was invented, like in the first decade when it started to be served, not in any mug, not in any tankard, but in glassware. Uh, in Bohemia, there were a lot of people that had never seen the color of their beer, at least from the side. And now all of a sudden we start selling these pure, light golden beers and it's heralded as so many good things, so much of the good stuff. It becomes a status. You deserve a refreshing drink. You deserve the best of the best. It's associated with a higher purity level, right? Because it's transparent. And some of that is publicity, of course, but I bet that's got to have some negative impact on the, the reign of the Porter beer. It's really the reign of the, of the British beer overall. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's not just the Porter. I mean, the Porter, at the moment of like kind of the ascendance of Pilsner uh, out of Central Europe, like the Porter is already on a decline in right. the face of the lighter pale, like pale ales and miles that are coming through. And... So the Pilsners, I mean, going all the way up to like the 1890s or so, you don't see British brewers seeing the Pilsner or just loggers in general uh, as any type of threat to their dominance. I mean, they're mm -hmm. kind of willfully ignorant, honestly. And, and <laughs> <the line. laughs> I, mean, I mean, God, in South Africa, in Cape Town, there is a, a British brewer uh, in the 1860s that attempts a lager brewery. Uh, and fails because at that point, I mean, British colony at that point, like they, no one's ready for it. No one, no one mm -hmm. wants it. Nobody cares. And, you know, so like 20 years later, like there's a huge change and he's like, yeah, I mean, I was just ahead of my time. I should have been like totally winning on this, on this front, but, you know, just a bit too early and in a British colonial market, of you know lots of different immigrants in Cape Town but like he was not on the right path at the right time right did that happen to many other breweries um did that happen in many other colonies now there there are other types of beers that seem to be uh much easier to produce in fact if you have enough capital and so many other places Yeah, I mean, you also, so I'm kind of going, going back to what I said earlier about mm -hmm. this, the climate of most of the colonies, uh, much, much warmer. So, I mean, 
in in Europe, like Northern Europe, you were seeing, you know, people were, I mean, there were laws against brewing really between kind of April to October because you couldn't control the fermentation or anything like in the summertime. So the beers were often go bad, spoil, um, just be unhealthy. And so actually I'm currently working on, on an article about mechanized refrigeration that should be published in about a year um, through the brewing industries because the rise of, well, any type of temperature control, first you need a thermometer to understand right. what the temperatures are, but right. then you have to understand temperature control and then how you're able to then control, not just like the boiling and like how to cool off the wort uh, as quickly as possible, but also like how long to ferment it and ferment it at what specific temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're looking at this kind of like the scientific revolution, sci not scientific revolution, the kind of yeast, pure yeast revolution um, going from like the 1870s onwards, where you were combining all of these different technologies to produce, well, choice being Pilsner, to produce like the most consistent beer possible. Because consistency throughout time of brewing is always a very hard thing to hit. Right. I, it is. That's why now everything's just. I mean, dialed in so tightly um, for brewing any type of beer now. And that's really kind of develops out of the industrial revolution, Porter being like the style that really helps push both with like the capital that's, that's produced um, to be able to innovate and like expand and try different techniques uh, through the you know through late 18th, early 19th century, like with a sacrometer, adding all these pieces in, they start using, you know, copper coils, you know, like they said, uh, a temperature, that like kind of thing, like to try to cool down the beer more quickly, uh, instead of kind of what they would do, they brew the beer down on the floor and then raise it to the top of the brewery where they have right. the area working on like using gravity from that point on yep. uh, to move the beer through the process. Uh, but then once you're able to use say copper coils, I mean, you have to have the ability to make copper coils that you could run water through. Right. First. So all these things come together in producing these beers and then going onwards, like to produce all the different beers. Cause now, I mean, it's not just the porter that's being made better and more consistently. It's the pale ales. It's the autumnal right. ale. It is the miles. It is like, you can make a low alcohol beer, a lower alcohol beer that is an excellent quality and is not just kind of the runoff of the mash. It uh, branches out, the know-how starts proliferating and that then leads to uh, more accessible, better and uh, cleaner beers all around. So the porter doesn't exactly die then, it becomes, let's say, the beginning for all sorts of new types of beers who then can use the knowledge. And I wonder, this is my last question, I promise. <laughs> um, where is the porter now in the global beerscape? <laughs> um, we know about one, one, one type of beer that has evolved out of the porter, the stout. And uh, it, stout kind of seems like it has a legitimately good name for itself it seems to be one of the big staples for the breweries who um, want to have one of their own styles uh, it seems to be really back on track um, but that's a mutation of the original recipe right what about the porter is it still a thing yeah but very not it's really declined just the past few years yeah it was actually kind of hard for me to find a port today. And yeah, I, it, it had a resurgence in the late, in like basically like late eighties and through the 1990s with craft beer. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you always have, so like the stat was initially just like a, the strong version of a porter. Right. Uh, and then, you know, with Guinness, I mean, like if you look at all the rec, like the trade records across the colonies, late 19th century, like Guinness was not, I mean, I hung out at the archives there, by the way, it's pretty cool. Uh, and they did not- You know I'm jealous right now, right? You are aware of my jealousy. <laughs> all the archives I went to and it was it was amazing. Yeah, nice. the research for my dissertation and like now again for the manuscript um, it has just been <laughs> one of the best parts about the whole process. Uh, but bet. yeah, I like, was not even marketing itself as Guinness until the 20th century. 
Wow. Like they were producing all of the beer. So you knew if you look at an advertisement in, well, say Cape Town or in Sydney, Australia or something that, you know, if there was an Irish stout coming in, you knew it was going to be produced at St. James Gate, but mm-hmm. it would be under the name of whatever bottler that they were you know, selling to. So they produce all the beer, then they put all of the distribution in the hands of different bottlers. Uh, and so that kind of gains its own traction and style. Like that whole story of just kind of like they hired these beer journalists, well, these uh, beer oh, travelers, uh, Arthur Shand is one of, the, one of the most famous, late 19th century to travel to every single market where Guinness was being sold to taste the Guinness in all of these places, like across the entire world. His, his notes and his journals are just amazing. Uh, so, I mean, he's just looking, I mean, whether it was on a cruise ship or in a pub in a, t- in a city or a small town, even he was testing the Guinness, uh, to make sure the bottlers were holding up their end. So <laughs> I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Is he like a freelance journalist who's, you know, up to get these guys from Guinness to try and be better than everyone? Or is he like, I don't know, a contractor who's working for Guinness for quality control? And also, I'm sorry, but I have to get, I have to ask you this again and again. <laughs> How was he not hammered the whole time? Uh, I mean, honestly, that's part of kind of uh, <laughs> being a beer writer, journalist, because also I, I write for a regional beer magazine. Uh, it's the Boston columnist, Yankee Brew News. Mm-hmm. And uh, a part of the process of kind of going to lots and lots of events and tasting lots and lots of beer is really learning, you know, how much to taste and right. what the goal of the, of the situation is. Mm-hmm. The goal is not to get drunk. The goal so, is to yeah. taste and converse and, you know, learn more about the stories that are involved in different types of beers. Mm-hmm. So Arthur Shand, he was not drinking Guinness day in, day out. He was mm-hmm. sipping Guinness day in, day out. Uh, what during all of his different travels and keeping meticulous notes mm-hmm. on on the different tastes, on different flavors, on the carbonation, on the consistency, all the way through. Uh, so he was, I mean, yes, drinking a lot, and he was hired by Guinness. Like he was, you know, he was one of two or three of these beer travelers, late 19th, early 20th century, traveling around to make sure that their product was consistent throughout. And then they take on doing their own distribution and marketing in the 19 teens. That's where you start seeing teens and 20s. You see the development of you know Guinness for health and all these things. Right. So stouts, I think, have really come back. We're looking at craft beer right now, mm-hmm. uh, if we look at the porter came back quite a bit through the 1990s and even like early 2000s, but it was still the moment of craft beer, like American craft beer, where it was about mimicking the European styles, like producing ales that hadn't been around in the United States, uh, you know, on a broad scale by anyone. So it was about reintroducing styles from mm. uh, the old country, if you will. And so it had a heyday and you also had, you know, imperial stouts coming in. You still see more Baltic porters now than just porters, mm-hmm. uh, you know, lagering and stuff. So they're looking for more robust, all these types of things. But the stout has come through i'm not entirely sure like if i was going to hypothesize i would say it's because of the ongoing popularity of guinness so the stout is still something that could be tied to a brand that has been produced with a long history long story and narrative so you see the stout going in and then also it's sweeter than a porter so you can see that part people are making you know milk stouts and you know the barrel aging with the stouts adding more adding all of the sweetness and the lactose and stuff to the stout instead of a porter And I think possibly because of the popularity throughout the past several hundred years of Guinness. So maybe just like that recognition of the Mm -hmm. style of that name as craft beer has changed considerably to being one of innovative flavors and focusing on narratives of authenticity and so forth, instead of just reintroducing new style, like returning styles to the public. Right. And I, I, I do remember seeing that Guinness is uh, maybe in the top 30 uh, in terms of uh, either exports or production worldwide. I mean, they have a fantastic success. But uh, if we go back to the uh, English Industrial Revolution, it's always complicated for me to say that because I think in French and we have the order completely upside down. It's always the opposite. (laughs) So that's why it takes me forever to say that still. 
what I think that I, I take away from this podcast, from our conversation is the porter is both the, the father and the child, if you want, of the uh, uh, revolution that took place, that, that changed, well, industrial processes, that changed consumption, that gave rise even in some parts to individualism, that gives us uh, the proletariat, right? And then at the same time, even though the porter sorts of starts fading away halfway through the 19th century, um, the technology that made it possible um, then also makes it possible for other beers to emerge and beers that are quite palatable also has some you know influence in changing the lifestyles of peoples. It also gives us a great topic for another podcast. <laughs> But uh, in all seriousness... Um, Thanks very much for uh, having been with us uh, for the, this podcast. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, thank you very, very much. I've had such a great time. All right. Hopefully we'll do that again. For those that are uh, listening to us, don't hesitate, don't hesitate to press the subscribe button if uh, you like this podcast. Cheers and see you in a bit.